The Secrets of Technology is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Technology. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Technology, where we discuss the technology news that's important to you from a uniquely Catholic point of view. And joining me today on the panel are Thomas Sanherho. Hi, Thomas. Hi, Dom. And Father Michael Gossett. Hi, Father Michael. Hi, Dom. Good to be here. Uh, welcome back. Uh, today we're, we've got a couple of good topics. We always have good topics, but today's topics are interesting. Uh, we, we're a little bit... Uh, Back in the newsy sorts of things that we're that we've been ta- uh, from what we've been talking about lately, uh, I guess as the fall approaches, uh, all the news is percolating up again. Uh, so our first topic has to do with um, one of the big tech companies, one of the Fang companies. You know, Fang is Facebook, Apple, Netflix, Google. Uh, so this one has to do with Google. Uh, Google had been in the news the last few years. Uh, uh, um. Related to its employees' political activities on the job, uh, the, the sometimes they uh, Google has a ro- <laughs> I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. Google has a robust internal communication system. Uh, think of like if you remember Google Plus, that that's basically their internal communication system, and they have lots of groups where employees can chat on so- topics of of interest. And some some of them, many of them had to do with interests that didn't have to do with work, uh, hobbies or, you know, woodworking or whatever. Uh, and some had to do with current events and politics. And on top of that, Google had gotten this, rep- has, has acquired this reputation as being internally hostile toward conservatives. Uh, there was a famous case recently about an, uh, an employee who was not a but by our standards, is probably like us sitting here, probably not as conservative as any of us. I'm just assuming. I don't know your politics necessarily, but uh, but he was not all that conservative, but had said some things and got ran out of town by his coworkers. So all that as a preface to say, Google has now uh, put in place a new policy banning political speech at work. The uh, it basically says no. Don't troll, name call, or engage in ad hominem attacks. Be respectful in your comments about and to your fellow Googlers. But it also says, um, while sharing information and ideas with colleagues helps build community, disrupting the workday to have a raging debate over politics or the latest news story does not. Our primary responsibility is to do the work we've each been hired to do, not to spend time working working time on debates about non-work topics. All right. So first off, just what do you think of this policy? Do you think it's a good policy for Google or any company to ban uh, uh, many or much of non- political discussion at work? Uh, that's stuff that's apart from the job. What do you think, uh, Thomas? I think, um, I don't know. This is a tough one. This is one where I would like to see the data on what they're calling political speech, (laughs) because I think when it comes down to it, there's a lot of different things that you can consider political speech. And so, you know, talking about news of the day, um, especially as Google employee, uh, it's going to be an important part of your job. And I would be surprised if there weren't some bias in what they're picking as this is political speech. We need to stop talking about it. Father Michael, what do you think of the policy? Yeah, I was trying to compare it to uh, like any other workplace or just some other job. Um, they're like, yeah, you wouldn't be encouraged to to have debates throughout the day. And like, I get the importance of discussion. I think it's probably safe to assume, as you said, that there's a hostility to conservatism, even even on an accidental level, just because of uh, the culture. But uh, I can see the point, like a legitimate point of a policy like this. But I think it's also easy to see how it would be used to, like, who gets to decide what is inappropriate. And once that's there, it uh, can easily be biased. You know, Thomas, one of the interesting things about this is how much of the pushback, how much of the concern comes from people who think it's a crackdown on liberal uh, political speech. 
Uh, right. But do you think that's you know, I mean, what do you think of that? Do you why do you think they 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 think it's a crackdown on them? Um, and do you think that's really what's going to happen? Um, I, actually, I do. Honestly, I do right now in the environment that we're in. And um, I, th I think that I, I can see from a company's perspective uh, talking about the news because we have such an incendiary figurehead right now that just mm -hmm. loves to throw firebombs and see where everybody falls on it. Uh, I can see uh, the the massive liberal glom that is Google's uh, hiring base um, just kind of going haywire with it and probably getting a little bit off track on what they're supposed to be doing by ranting and raving about the things that are going on. So this might actually be one of those situations where Google is cracking down on the more liberal speech because they're, people aren't getting work done. <laughs> right. And there's probably more, like, as people say, m a larger percentage of the workforce probably has more liberal views. So that's more disruptive overall when there's, when there's all that talk on it. I mean, to, right. from my point of view, I mean, pe employees will chat about things, you know, over coffee at the water cooler. I mean, that always happens. But in general, it's all every place that I've worked, including at the archdiocese, has sort of frowned on political activism in the workplace. I mean. When I worked for the church, you know, pro there was pro life stuff we did. We actually worked on uh, uh, educating people about an assisted suicide uh, ballot question. So there was a certain amount of politics involved, but you know, campaigning, talking down uh, on an official bulletin board, an in-house system, uh, talking down po particular politicians or particular points of view or or, or particular other employees, colleagues. That would be. I don't. I can't think of any place I've ever worked where that would be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, that, and that might be that might be part of the problem when you get um a uh, well a uh, uh, just a general perspective um uh wind tunnel of information. You know, where you've got just this this group of people that all agree and they all keep bouncing the same idea kind of off of each other over and over and over again until it gets to a point where it's just too much and um and that that might be the problem that they're running into is that they have too much um uh homogenized uh viewpoint going on there <laughs> right and as we're in an era now where if you think differently if you have a different viewpoint from me that's not just merely a difference of opinion that is uh an unbreachable divide that is you you are a hater you that sort of thing an instance of that of this of what of the culture at google that really kind of strikes home is the the thing that happened with uh, Matt Frad. You guys, who are, I think you're, bo mm -hmm. are you both familiar with that. So yep. Matt Frad mm -hmm. is a Catholic speaker and author, and he uh, also speaks against pornography, uh, the pernicious effects pornography has on individuals and on society. Well, he was invited to come speak at Google, not by the corporation, but by a group of employees who were uh, who received permission from the corporation to have him. To come fly out from Atlanta to San Francisco to talk about the non-religious effects of pornography. So to talk about pornography from a from a non-religious viewpoint. Which, uh, if if you don't know Matt Fred, he he does have a, that a Catholic perspective, but he yes. also has a very secular perspective about it. That's very good. Right. Mm -hmm. It's often like like uh, you can have a Catholic perspective on pro life issues, but you can also talk about why abortion is bad from a purely secular viewpoint too. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he gets out there. He's in San Francisco and gets a call the day before when the apparently some people, some employees found out that he was coming to speak and they 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 went and looked up his social media presence because that's what we do these days. Uh, saw him say things that are pretty much standard Catholic teaching on uh, same sex attraction and other uh, you know sexuality issues and. Went to somebody at corporate, and his in the short, the long story short, his invitation got pulled. He was no longer uh, allowed to speak on campus. It turns out he, uh, they ended up um, getting together off campus outside of business hours, and he gave his talk there. But um, it's uh, it it's a I think it's a illustrative uh, moment to, to kind of talk about like you to show like you know what kind of environment we're talking about, and not just at Google, but at a lot of companies, especially some of these high-tech companies, uh, mm -hmm. where uh, certain kinds of viewpoints 
are frowned upon are really you know if 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 i mean to be quite honest as is if, if i had to go get a job out in the workplace in where i live in the boston area i'd be very worried about people googling my past googling things my beliefs you know now, i haven't yeah. even necessarily said anything all that uh controversial but in this day and age in this environment it's it's worrisome that's that's the i think the weird dichotomy that uh the whole internet culture very much promotes like utter free speech you can anything can be out there that's that's what it's for it's the wild west um but alongside that as you guys said a little bit ago just that hypersensitivity and that we can't hear any dissenting viewpoint from uh from the what's what's accepted and and just that those things come together in Google in a really weird way. And I can't imagine what it would be like to work there and not be totally, I guess, bought into that viewpoint. I, I think, um, I think the, the interesting thing there is that and knowing, knowing Matt Fred's content, knowing uh, some of the stuff that he said and how he says it and the way he approaches things, it really was just, an, uh, a hypersensitivity issue, and I know that I'm. I know that when, whenever I find something in the church that I that is disagreeable to my, uh, you know, liberal sensibilities, because I, I'm probably much more liberal than both of you guys uh, in in my perspective. But um, when when I find something that's that you know just rubs the wrong way, I dig I dig at it, and I figure out why it is that the church thinks that way. And a lot of times, it's a very humanitarian, just not if you can make a secular argument that is exactly equal to the church's argument for why things should be a certain way and and to me that's the impressive thing about the church is that it really does kind of embrace that um you know people are people and and god doesn't say that we need to be this way because he's just got these these rules that you have to follow but that it's what's best for us right yeah, we're we're not we don't have uh, as much as the world would like it. We don't have like this religious box that that we have part of put part of ourselves into, and that sits over here on the shelf uh, until we you know are on Sunday. Uh, I mean, we are we're whole human beings, and the 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 church's teachings are address us as we are, not right. just as you know. It's not just for Christians. It sort of addresses the reality of what, the way people are. Uh, so yeah, I I get what you're saying there that it's it, it, you know that there's this tendency to kind of say oh the, well that's just your belief that's just the church's teaching as if it were somehow this arbitrary uh, r set of rules that some guys came up with in a back room as opposed to just describing the universe as it is right um, and that and and people push against that. Um, so I, I think with Google, you know, one I think some of this is Google's own fault. They were famously um, freewheeling for many years, where a lot anything goes. You the, you know you work for eighty percent of your time on work on stuff you're assigned, and twenty percent of the time you can work on your pet projects, and you know just don't do do no evil. And and they they kind of inculcated this this freewheeling atmosphere, which a lot of tech companies have done. And I think it's coming around as they've gotten so big and powerful, it's come to the point where they realize, you know, maybe there's a reason why a lot of big old companies don't do this. Ah, uh, uh, Facebook and, wait a minute, the whole group of them is kind of finding <laughs> that out, aren't they? Right, yeah. right. I have heard anecdotes of from people who've worked high up at Apple, um, third and fourth hand, so so nobody I, I know it, 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 uh, directly. But you know who've gone to work at Apple in a, in a in an executive position and left within six months because they realized the, the not only is it so high powered that you're just go 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 all the time, but the environment is a is as they described it aggressively um, social engineering aggressively pushing a particular viewpoint um, at least in the culture of the company uh, not necessarily pushing on the on the the customer. But within the co the company's culture, and they just couldn't deal it. Despite how well the job paid, which I'm sure paid very well, uh, they left very quickly afterward because it just wasn't something they could do. Uh, so it's this is something that bears keeping an eye on. Um, you know, as, as some employees complained, you know, what, 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 we we want to be able to speak. Why can't we speak? This is this is 
well, I mean, there are other jobs, <laughs> you know, there are right. other companies. Right. And, and there's, and there's, and, but you're going to find the same problem in the other companies. You're not going to be allowed to just say whatever you want, whenever you want. Right. And, uh, you know, and, and I think that's kind of the, that's kind of what this wheels back to is that, that, um, and, and it really is, it's because all these places, they have such a cult of personality. And you see, you know, every one of these uh, tech uh, giants like this, you can point to one or two individuals who really started it, who were the real front runners. And once those individuals step back, then the the culture kind of falls into this, you know, it needs some guidance. It needs some of that, uh, some of the traditional values that come along with how a big corporation is supposed to run. They they hired the HR people. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's also uh, super interesting just how, like, these discussions they're happening in a company, and I just think like how I don't know how wrapped up your identity could be. Like you said, a cult of personality, but just that idea like my primary way of identifying myself and my community is where I work, and it's a right. company that helps me search for things on the internet. Uh, that's an strange, important strange that's world. A, that's an important aspect. A lot of these companies have really created this idea of your life revolves around your job. I mean, right to the point where you go, they take care of your, your uh, caring for your children, doing your laundry, uh, getting haircuts, but they have like a barber shop on campus. Uh, they, you know, of course they feed you all the free food. I mean, people practically live at Facebook and at Google and at Apple. I mean, it, I'd, I'd, I'd be surprised if they didn't start putting in, you know, uh, bunk beds and offices soon so that people could really live there. I mean, it's I, I'd be really surprised if they didn't already have that. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. There's probably bunk rooms at some of these places. And I've heard stories from people who've worked at these companies where, yeah, your identity, you become, as they say, a Googler, you know, or mm -hmm. uh, an, an Appler. Uh, you know, they you, you be, your identity becomes wrapped up in this. And so this is your community. This is your, I mean, in some ways, like uh, in, a, in a previous time, someone might call, think of themselves as American. I think some of these mm -hmm. people think of themselves as Googlers in that sense, mm -hmm. or, and that's just one company, mm -hmm. or other companies, their identity becomes connected to it. So then to hear that they are free speech uh, in this place is curtailed, that would be the no, yeah. not a surprise. Well, and it speaks to the larger problem in our country of, of having a lack of things for us to identify with. And, yes. um, you know, the, the lack of religion that we're having, the, the, the lack of uh, social groups to fill that, to fill that gap, uh, it's telling. And it's, I think it's really it's, yep. it's costing people a lot in their identity. We are social creatures that need those sorts of connections, and mm -hmm. we'll find them where, we, where they are made available. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, we'll we'll keep track of this story as we go along. You know, as time goes on, and anything that comes up with it, we'll we'll come back and revisit it. This is Dom Bettinelli, CEO of the StarQuest Production Network, with a special message. StarQuest needs your help. Over the past year, we've grown by leaps and bounds. Every month, we produce dozens of shows covering numerous topics and all explore the intersection of faith and pop culture, which is the core of our mission. Some are among the most popular shows SQPN has ever produced in all its 13-year history. We're fulfilling our mission of evangelization in a whole new way, but that success is in danger. We must reach the financial break-even point if we're going to continue. Creating a dozen shows has caused our expenses to go up. We currently aren't making ends meet, and we're rapidly eating through our reserves. Soon they'll be gone and we'll have to cut back many of our shows. We might even have to shut down altogether. That's why it's crucial we hear from you right now. Please visit sqpn.com slash give today and click the Become a Patron button to make your monthly pledge. Or to give a one-time gift, click the Donate button. The need is urgent, so please go to sqpn.com slash give today. Thank you from all of us at StarQuest and God bless you. May we hear from you today. I want to move on to our second story uh, this time, which is uh, on, uh, we've talked about this before, robocalls are a pernicious problem uh, and continue to be so, uh, despite our all of our efforts and the apps that the phone companies give us, they still get through, I still get robocalls, um, and it's, it's a real pain. I usually don't answer uh, calls without caller ID, uh, which, which is usually okay, except when I'm expecting a phone call from, say, like a delivery guy who's going to call me 30 minutes before he shows up. And so I have to answer my call and get all these robocalls. So, uh, but it turns out that um, there's a big deal in the works. The all 50 States and the federal government have created this deal, this, this pact 
with all the phone companies to combat robocalls. This is, I mean, it doesn't mean it's going to stop tomorrow, but it, what it says is, is that there's a, there's a big move ahead. There's a big agreement that we've got to do something about this. It's become too much of a problem. And uh, they're going to provide call, better call blocking uh, and better information for free to all phone users. Uh, you're not going to have to pay extra to get uh, robocall blocking. So uh, you guys have, I assume you've, read, you've seen the article, you've read the, some of the details, um, and we'll go through them as we talk about it. But what do you think about this up front? Father Michael, what do you think of uh, this this agreement? Do you think it's going to make things better? I think it'll, it's, it's probably a step of what it takes because uh, just like the little bit that I've read about and listened to podcasts about uh, the technology behind robocalls, it's just, it's so powerful. We're all getting them. We're getting them from numbers that look like either our own number or someone that we know. And yeah, it takes going that, I think that far up the chain where they can just get on it in a way that we can't as individuals. Um, I think just the other part, and I think it was mentioned in the article that like illegal things are happening. People are being scammed. And uh, I just think of, especially like vulnerable people, older people uh, that maybe don't understand necessarily what's going on with some of these calls like it's it's worth fighting i yeah i i have um i've been getting a call lately from the social security administration and uh, <laughs> it's happened several times but i i can you know i i can go oh that's ridiculous they wouldn't do that but uh i can see a person who's on social security benefits getting really concerned about uh you know what that means and calling the number back and um, when it happens several times and it starts sounding more and more official every time it happens it's 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 disconcerting and that was me blocking the numbers. Every time they came through, I have a function on my phone that I can block numbers. So it was a different phone number right. uh, each and every time. Uh, but then on the turn of that, I had a gentleman call me today who he was, we were uh, sharing contact information. He called me to share his contact information with me and his number popped up as scam likely. So I don't know hmm. oh, wow. how that happened, but that was, uh, you know, it's the turn of the, the concept of how much is too much almost. Well, I wonder if if one of these robocallers uh, faked his number, you know, in their right. one of their scams, and that's what the, what happens. This is the the problem with the technology is is these robocallers they they the calls are made over the internet, you know, they're VoIP calls, and the 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 system. No one back in the day when they were coming up with the system, no one thought to protect us from spoof calling. Like the the the, the system trusts that. Whatever the call says its originating number is, is actually its number. And that's a huge hole in the system. Uh, and it, w the technology that they're going to implement now that they've agreed to is a, I don't, I haven't seen a lot on this, but my guess is this, this is more of an idea. It's closer to uh, idea than it is to implementation in a product yet, but it's something called, they call shake and stir, which is, it, it, it basically Vet, uh, vets and validates that the number that it says it is is actually the number that th that's being called from and if it if it's not they won't it won't let it through that will take care of they say of about 40 or 50 percent of all the those robocalls like especially the ones that look like they're from your town they have the first the area code and your right. local exchange uh, luckily for me i my cell phone i only have a cell phone my cell phone is from a town that's on the other side of the state that I've never lived in. When I got this number 20 odd years ago, uh, like literally, um, that's where the, 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 the mall kiosk guy's uh, office was or something, you know? So <laughs> anytime I get a call from that town, I know it's, it's a fake. It's, I don't, I've never, you know, I've never lived there. I don't know anyone there. So it's, uh, so it's useful that way. But for a lot of people, it's, oh, it's someone in my town. It's a neighbor. Um, and especially those, the more vulnerable people. So, I applaud this. I hope it it becomes something useful because it's really a scourge. I liken it to spam. Remember when you'd get so, like you couldn't sort through your spam in your inbox between the good stuff and the spam. And nowadays, I, every once in a while, I, I look in my Gmail spam folder and I'm like appalled at how much there is and yeah. wondering who is <laughs> who is actually seeing any of this. Uh, <laughs> But uh, and and then I get nervous because, like you said, there are some false positives where I I find actual email I want in in the spam folder. Uh, and so, but but spam is better than it used to be. I'm hoping that robocalls 
end up like that. What do you think? Do you, are we? Is is this likely to happen? I didn't think spam would go away. Uh, it was so <laughs> it was so everywhere for that period of time, and it seems to have been figured out. So maybe it's possible. It's harder. It's harder with voice though, just because of the um the the ca- the technical capabilities of right. uh, interpreting what's going on. Because you know your computer can read the whole email before it tosses it into your inbox or not, right. which is another concern. Uh, you know that, that you might have security wise but um it's it's much harder for a computer to interpret uh a uh, a phone call but uh, you know and i i've been really impressed some of the robocalls i've been gotten have been very slick lately and i i hesitate to call them robocalls but they're like the um the the highway patrol uh oh, wow. fund uh they have it's a robocall but it's someone sat down and recorded something, and then it has a series of responses that it gives to you based on whether you're saying yes or no back to it. Mm-hmm. And so it asks a yes or no question. If you say yes, it gives you this one response. If you say no, it gives you this other response. All pre-recorded, so it sounds very official. But you can tell just by the stilt of the voice and how you can't interrupt the, interrupt the guy uh, at all <laughs> that, mm-hmm. that he, there's not another person on the other end of the line. Yeah, some of the defense against the robocalls these days is – just how poorly done most of them are Oh with, yeah, yeah, with really bad accents that you can hardly understand or, you know, that they want you to pay your IRS bill with Apple gift cards or other <laughs> like, like, you're uh-huh. like, oh, okay, I, I get that this is a fake call, you know, but the, the trick is, is when they start getting realistic and they start sounding real, that's when you get, it's worrisome. So we have to stop this before it, it gets too far. Uh, but hopefully, I mean, this is a hopeful, I think it's a hopeful, uh, 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 agreement and maybe we'll we'll get uh, something resolved with it. Uh, so I I do want to uh, move on to our picks of the week. We are uh, going to have a, a bit of a shorter show this week. So that's just uh, uh, w- there's a lot of news coming up in September. Uh, so uh, get w- get prepared for that because we get uh, all kinds of announcements coming and uh, we'll be we'll be covering those. But uh, let's move to our picks of the week. Father Michael, what's your pick this week? So this is an app I just found out about today, so I can't say I've, I've tried it a whole lot, but from what I have, I'm really interested in it. It's called Dark Noise uh, for iOS, and it's basically a noise-making app for, I don't know about you, I, sometimes I like to fall asleep to like noise of a thunderstorm or something like that. Um, but this one has more options than I would have imagined in a noise-maker app. It has things like coffee shop, it has airplane, um, Lots of different nature sounds, a, a campfire, uh, just normal white noise. And so if that's something, especially if people have like uh, tinnitus or just some situation like that, it can be really helpful. And I find it's a really nice version of uh, an app like this. And it's like three ninety nine. All the options are there. And uh, so I think it's a pretty good deal for a very well-made app. The animations really impressively made. Everything's animated. It's very smooth. Lots of different color changes, and uh, uh, you can change the icon if that's something you're excited about. Very yeah, cool. I, and uh, it's three ninety nine, so it, and it's a pay it's a pay in advance, uh, which is you know I, I support that. Pay, mm-hmm. You know, pay for a good app if if it works well. If you live near a busy street, I used to live on a busy street where cars constantly. When I was working, it it was really nice to have something, you know, r- a rhythmic noise that was not cars honking and all that sort of stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. was helpful. So that that's actually good. If you work in a, in an office that has an open off, open floor plan, that can be really good cuz I I once worked in an office with an open floor plan and my neighbor in the cubicle next to me uh really liked to eat carrots sticks. <laughs> and it was like living next to a rabbit. Oh no. <laughs> so having noise to cover that was necessary. I would have loved to have had this an app like this. Yeah. Uh excellent. Thank you for your pick. Uh sure. Thomas, what's your pick this week? Okay, so my pick this week, I, I've done a lot of the talking about the 3D printing and um, things like that. Uh, now I'm going to go for the 3D modeling and rendering. Mm. If you need a video editor, this this uh, program will do it. It's called Blender 3D. Uh, it's a free app. It's open source. Uh, it has all the bells and whistles that you'd expect from uh, a good 3D rendering app. Uh, and they just upgraded to a brand new version over the summer. I am super excited about it because it has a live uh, rendering of whatever you're putting together. So if you're making a really highly textured, or highly polished scene, uh, you can get a live view of what it is. So you don't have to guess and then go and render it, wait for a few hours and then come back and look at it. You can actually see uh, more or less what's going on right there uh, live while you're doing it. 
fantastic app. Uh, and it, it does have an integrated video editor and the whole nine yards. It used to have a, uh, a, a game engine in it too, but they took that out in the newer version. And I'm hoping it comes back. I'm hoping it makes it back. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I th isn't Blender the one they used to make Big Buck Bunny? The, yes, uh, that's it. That's the one. Yeah, so. Big Buck Bunny was a sort of, it, it was really good animation, community source. Like it was hundreds of people all worked on it together. And it looked like something out of Pixar or DreamWorks or Disney. You know, it looked really, really well done. My kids love that. Like, like five is five years ago. I mean, yeah. five year old, five years ago technology. Uh, like my kids used to love Big Buck Bunny. So, and I remember Blender was was key to that. So, good pick. Good There's pick. one that's less kid friendly. That's called um, Cosmos Laundromat, uh -huh. and um, it's all done in Blender as well. Uh, and it's about a, a suicidal sheep and. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it it looks dead on for a Pixar movie. Like you would not be able to distinguish it from a Pixar movie at all. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Cool. Uh, I wish I was an artist. I would love to play with stuff like this. Uh, so my pick this week. So uh, picture this. You're asleep on a Saturday morning, maybe at 430 in the morning. And suddenly your your smoke alarm goes off in the hall outside your room. And you bolt out of bed and rush out there. There's no fire. It's just a broken smoke detector, uh, <laughs> and that's that's what I, I mean. Usually, it's the beep every every five minutes. Uh, ah. That's that's actually worse <laughs> because you don't know which one it is. You have, and you stand under it and you're like waiting for it to beep again. Um, <laughs> and so I finally uh, that's it. I'm done with that smoke detector. And over the past few years, I've been I've been gradually replacing my smoke detectors as they've gone bad with the Nest Protect smoke detectors. And here's why I think they're better. Uh, one so one, they will tell you when the battery is going ba bad. They will alert you with a notification on your phone. This one in the hallway is going. The battery is dying. Not beep. Guess where I am? <laughs> beep. Oh, not that one. No, it's the worst <laughs> game of hide and seek. <laughs> the worst, especially at two o'clock in the morning. Uh, but also, uh, when. When I, we have a small house, when we cook, and I mean, I and I open the oven because uh, I'm broiling something, and this and the the smell, not even smoke, the smell goes up. It sets off the smoke detector in the hall, and then what we've always had to do is go bring a chair, climb up, take it down, throw it in the bedroom, close the door, you know that whole thing. Well, now you, I can just open the, I can hit the notification on my app and silence the alarm right there, um, and it tells me which alarm. The other thing is they're all networked, and it will tell me which alarm is going off. So if I get if then they all go off. So if there's a, you know, God forbid that there's a fire in my office on the other side of the house from our bedrooms in the middle of the night, our smoke detector in our room will go off. So I don't have to wait for the smoke to roll down the hall and for me to hopefully hear the smoke detector in the office uh, going off. So uh, all those things, you know, and there are other products out there that are like it that are networked and have an app and the but the Nest has always worked well for me and we have the Nest uh, thermostat as well. I've had that for years, and so the, the, it's always been a good product. So that's that's my pick of the week is the Nest Protect uh, smoke and carbon monoxide alarm. All right, so those are some good picks. Uh, we will have links to the picks and to all of the stuff we talked about in the show notes. Uh, before we finish up, I do want to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of technology, including Patrick S., Robert B., Peter H., Joshua R., and Dawn C., their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of technology and all the shows at StarQuest, and you can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. So if you have uh, anything you'd like to say about what our discussion about Google's speech crackdown on the robocalls or our picks of the week or any other technology topic, uh, please let us know by going to sqpn.com slash technology or the SQPN Facebook page at facebook.com slash StarQuest Media, or send us an email to technology at sqpn.com. Please remember to like the show when you find it on the Facebook or retweet it on Twitter. We were at SQPN, and leave us comments on social media. Uh, we love to interact with you there as well. Until next time, Father Michael Gossett, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of technology. Thank you. Thomas Sanherho, thank you as well. Thanks for having me. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Technology on StarQuest.